How do you network at conferences? Most people in crypto can hardly speak to another person very comfortably. So when you get to an in real life event, what do you say? Well, I'm not an expert myself, but I do have a subject matter expert and, you know, an absolute legend in the space, Cash from Super Team. He's the operator that's just shipped so much with Super Team. He's now even more known as basically being a talking head, famous for content, <laughs> an MC, like the master of ceremonies of Solana, if not crypto. Let's hand you over to Cash the expert. How are you, Cash? I'm doing well. Thank you for that very warm intro, Seb. Pleasure. So this is the tweet that you've done. My first time going viral. And I will it, say it is every bit as addicting as uh, people say it is. It's also, it's jam-packed full of alpha. This is what we want. It's hard to network really well at conferences. So I was hoping we could go through this kind of step-by-step -step from two viewpoints as maybe a founder just building something. They want to attract maybe the right talent or a little bit of VC funding. But at the same time, it's hard and they don't know what to do. And then maybe just from someone going that wants to make some connections, you know, because we always want more connections for more alpha. How That's should we do it? If you're a founder trying to make the most of a conference, it is critical to put the work in before you actually get there, right? Like the game begins well before the conference actually starts. Uh, and in the thread, I talk about a few tips that I think are useful to help kind of frame your mind and make sure that you're able to get the most out of the conference when you actually get there. Here's the big mistake that you need to avoid at all costs. Do not do an elevator pitch to everyone that you meet. There is this idea that like, oh, if I'm a founder, I have to constantly be selling myself. And the answer is that there is some truth to that. But you don't want to be selling yourself in ways that are going to drive people away from you. Two minutes might feel like a little bit of time to you when you've spent thousands of hours on your startup. But two minutes is an interminable amount of time for somebody else to just listen to you monologue. So instead, what I highly encourage you to do is to set up a very short intro right? Three or four sentences is usually all you need. And you want to practice this and refine this the same way you might practice your uh, actual elevator pitch, right? So you'll have a clear one-liner to maybe start it off. But critically, the last thing that you should say should be something that inspires some curiosity, that allows somebody to ask a question as a follow-up. The reason this is so useful is that if you're talking to the wrong person or there's a kind of a big mismatch, they won't ask a question and then you'll know that this is not going to be a fruitful conversation. And then you can eject before any kind of social capital is burned or before they get a bad opinion of you. If you instead take the full two minutes and you'll notice that they're starting to look at their clock or rolling their eyes or looking around the room, they're forever going to remember you as the most annoying person at the conference. Time is valuable to everybody. As you said, two minutes is actually a bit of an eternity. If you are not speaking to the right person that is going to elicit the response that you're after, then you've wasted, I don't know, what's four sentences, 15 seconds, as opposed to two minutes. I think most people can confront 15 seconds. I'm not the most patient person in the world. Two minutes for me is way too long. So I agree. Number two here is to have a plan before you go to the conference, right? The kind of natural thing to do that I've seen for many people at conferences is that they'll just kind of go and like, I'm here to meet interesting people. And you have this kind of vague goal. And as a result, you end up having like a vague time and you have like ambiguous results that come out of it if you have ambiguous goals going into it, right? So what I really encourage people to do is to have a clear plan. If you're a founder, you probably want to know, okay, which venture capitalists are there? Which potential partners are there? Uh, what kind of press people are going to be there that I might be able to talk to on the sidelines, right? And then literally have like a hit list. And then you can check it off as you go through the conference. You can turn this into a bit of a video game for yourself as well. Every day, I want to take five people off my hit list, for example. Maybe you're not fundraising, right? As a founder, then you probably want to start to look for users. And then your real goal is to just kind of naturally find people who have similar interests as you, which might mean attending the same talks and talking to them as I talk about later in the thread uh, or something else entirely. But here's the key point, right? Operating without a plan means you're gonna operate without much success. So go in there with something intentional in order to make sure that you can judge, was this a good use of your time or not? Number three, be smart about who you're trying to network with. This is a hard one insight from my actual personal experience here. For example, at Solana Breakpoint, everyone wants to talk to Mert. Everyone wants to talk to Tolly and Raj. And the fact is when you have this kind of inundated, uh, all of these people are relatively high in social status. And so they have a lot of people that want to talk to them. You're not the only one. And as a result, they have very limited bandwidth and very little bit of mind share, right? Uh, and just in general, if you are the founder of a very successful protocol, successful enough that you are on the main stage giving talks and whatever else, you probably don't have a lot of time. And so when you're thinking about the hit list and you're thinking about who you're trying to network with, you want to make sure that you're working with people or you're meeting people that can actually help you. And that you can also help in return, by the way. It's not meant to be like a one-way street. If you are, let's say you work in business development at a protocol, it means you probably don't need to talk to the founder. Maybe you need to talk to the engineering team lead or somebody on the engineering team, right? If you are a founder, you want to think about who is the actual persona who's going to be buying your product. We're going to be paying for your service and then talk to them directly. Maybe it's the marketing director. It doesn't necessarily have to be the founder in all cases. Similarly, right, if you're trying to get a lot of outreach, 
maybe you don't talk to Seb Monty. Maybe you find some smaller creators that you can see or walk around with vlog cameras uh, because they're much more likely to have the space and the ability to help you in a practical way. Not to be vain, but you've used me in an example. You're, you're more sought after than I am. What do you do when people come up to you and they try to take time and you just know you don't have the bandwidth? Like what happens? I am very lucky to have a, a very good team at uh, Super Team. So uh, very often if somebody comes up to me, I'll just say, hey, what country are you from? Uh, or where do you live? And then I'll just kind of redirect them to whichever Super Team country lead is closest uh, to them. Number four, come prepared with one or two questions, each for key people you wanted to talk to? This is this is good. I've never even heard of this either. Yeah, so there's two interviewers that are just like world class. One of them is called Tyler Cowen, who's an economist at George Mason University and arguably the smartest guy alive, quite frankly. If you listen to his podcast, Conversations with Tyler, it'll change your life because it'll entirely reframe the way that you think about interview conversations. The other is Nardwar, who's much more fun and he mostly interviews like rappers and rock bands on YouTube. What they both share is that they come with this hyper-personalized question. They have done the work. And when they ask a question to their guest or to their interviewee, that person can immediately tell that they've done the work. It's not, oh, tell me about your company or, oh, what was like hard for you? It's no, let me talk about the specific thing that you mentioned in an interview 12 months ago and ask you if that problem has been solved. I'll give you a personal example. I have a personal website, cashonda.com. And on there, it talks, uh, I have a little section for this newsletter that I used to write called the, the Happiness Workout Plan. I only wrote like five or six issues of it. I wrote this when I was like 23 or something like that. And there was a guy, uh, shout out to Charville, who when I first met him, that was the first thing that he talked about with me. It was incredibly uh, refreshing and it immediately snapped me out of the conference days of like, oh yeah, here's about Super Team, here's about Super Team. Instead he's like, hey, what happened with the happiness workout plan? What motivated you to, to write that? I still remember Charville to this day uh, because I shout out to Charville because it was clear that he had done some work in advance uh, that he was actually interested in more than just kind of like leveraging super team or leveraging my position. And he wanted to talk to more about me as a person. I found that really interesting and he cut through all the noise. So out of the hundred conversations I had that day, three or four years ago, that's the only one that I remember. And if you can find an opportunity to do this as well, it'll be the same for you. So if you're able to talk to someone in that kind of like higher social status, not necessarily me, but you know, your Mertz, your Tolles, your Sebs, uh, doing the background research and trying to find a little bit, uh, something like a little kernel that might actually get them to light up, that gets their eyes to light up, I think is a cheat code to being remembered by them. That is a cheat code. I don't remember a lot of people, but you've got other tips on how to remember them. So that works mm -hmm. really, really well. Number five here, uh, I didn't even know you, I had to actually chat GPT what this even meant in terms of uh, a replacement short key. I haven't done that on my phone before, but I've worked out how it's done now. But this is another really good advice for anyone that's building something. One objection that someone might have to this kind of, uh, to some of the earlier advice, right? Is, well, if I don't tell them all about my product, how will they know if I'm any good or if I'm valuable to talk to? Uh, if I only if I have four sentences to do it, it might not convey the kind of complexity or the richness of what I'm building. And the answer is, don't sweat it. Record a demo. Showing is always better than telling in 100% of cases. If you have nothing to show, you got to think about what kind of networking you're trying to do and maybe try to build something such that you can. This might actually end up being your pitch deck if you're in an earlier stage. Maybe it's not actually your application, but hopefully it is. And mm -hmm. the cheat code here is just that it is very annoying to wait while someone tries to pull up a link right? Uh, they have to like go into my Google Drive, or I have to like go search through my other messages and copy and paste and put it back. Uh, so text replacements will change your life, not just for conferences, but in general, you should absolutely have your phone number, your email, your home address, uh, and a few other things like maybe your passport number, etc. If you travel a lot, saved as text replacement short keys, they just save you tons of time. And it's an easy one, such that as soon as somebody says like, Oh, that's kind of interesting, they've asked a few follow up questions from your earlier four sentences, you say, let me just send you a demo it takes two seconds, they have it right then and there. They might even watch it in the moment, but if not, there's no awkward fumbling or awkward silence. So the energy kind of stays alive. And you can do this with your uh, Apples and Androids. I, I Googled it, brand new to me, but I've got it. Um, you're not a you're not a handshaker. I was, I was. Actually, uh, shout out to Balaji. He was the one that kind of showed me this for the first time at a conference where he would just kind of walk up to everybody and do a little fist bump. I thought it was very odd, especially this really became prominent during COVID, right? Is that everyone was terrified in the first conferences after COVID of getting sick themselves. Uh, and so some people very smartly started to default to the fist bumps. And I think that's just way better. Like for one, it's faster. For two, I don't have to worry about like my sweaty palms or your sweaty palms. And for three, you don't get sick as often because there's less kind of transmission of germs. So this is just like, a good hygiene kind of thing to do. Makes sense. Uh, and uh, you're you're now dead. So yeah. you're not going to parties a night? I, won't, I don't know if I'll go to a single party in a night. I might be home by, asleep by 930, you know, inshallah. But for those of you who are maybe younger and actually out there doing more stuff, the advice here is don't try to do too much. There is, here's a basic truth. Networking is uncomfortable. 
And it kind of sucks, right? Like it feels, you feel very awkward putting yourself out there. It feels very awkward to approach people. And so what most of us will do is try to take, uh, remove ourselves from that discomfort. One very easy way to mitigate that is to just go to 10 events in a night, each for five minutes, talk to the two people that you know there, and then be like, ah, maybe let's go check out this other party instead. And then you go out. And really what you're doing is you are running away from the discomfort. You are running away from your anxiety. And that might feel good in the moment, but it's not gonna get you the long-term results. So the advice here is stay in one place and feel the discomfort until you feel so uncomfortable sitting alone in the corner of the room or until you feel so useless not talking to anybody that you are kind of compelled to cross that boundary and start to network with some other folks. I like number eight as well. If you're Nigel no friendsing it, Nigel no friends it with another Nigel no friends. I'm not sure if that's a, a saying outside of Australia. I don't think it is. But I think that I context clues are everything and I understand what you're saying here. Uh, and indeed, I think that this more broadly, uh, or this is a kind of a symptom of, of something that I think is really important more broadly, uh, which is practicing going first, right? Everyone loves it when they're sitting alone and somebody else tries to be your friend. Like, oh, it's so much easier. But you gotta practice going first if you really wanna make a dent in this universe. And this is the easiest way I know to do it. Because if somebody is watching a talk, you have with you know 95% certainty, at least one question you can ask them. What did you think of the talk? Or what do you think of the speaker? Or what do you think of this topic, right? It's very easy to break the ice. Versus like when you're standing in line getting food, you can be like, hey, do you like couscous? Like, no, it's very awkward or strange, right? This is much easier to do. And they'll be very grateful for it. They're more than likely going to want to talk back to you because they are sitting alone and they're also at a conference and also trying to meet some people more than likely. And so I think that this is a, a really easy hack. Just like look for people who are sitting alone, go sit next to them, introduce yourself, give them a little fist bump and be like, hey, what'd you think of the last talk? Simple, done. And number nine, for people who you really want to talk to, watch the talks, take notes, come up with questions. This is pretty simple and self-explanatory, but you've got some more insight on it, most likely. Specific compliments, less ideal, and give them to the speaker when you come across them to start the conversation. I've done some speaking in my day at conferences, and people will sometimes come up and be like, oh, Cash, I loved your talk, which is great for my ego, but compliments, they wash over you very quickly, and they kind of like fall off because you know if you are have any degree of humility you're not trying to like hold on to every nice thing that people say and it's hard to kind of like jump into a conversation just from a compliment but specific questions really work the reason i wanted to break this out i'd say it's really for people that you need to talk to is that sitting and watching the talks at a conference has an opportunity cost 30 minutes of sitting and watching a talk in silence more than likely is 30 minutes of not meeting new people or not talking to other folks right and so you need to do something that justifies that cost uh, justifies that opportunity cost that you're giving up. And so that's where like specific questions become really valuable to say like, hey, halfway through your talk, you mentioned this kind of point. Uh, you know, in my experience, I've seen uh, the contrary, like what would you see there? Or uh, I really struggle with XYZ point that you discussed here. Like what kind of advice would you give to somebody in my position? Things like that uh, tend to be much more effective. Number 10, message a few people ahead of time, asking them to set up time to chat. This is before before you get to the conference, people you might be interested in, that's your plan there? Correct. I have not done this as often. I prefer to be like a little bit, uh, like to just float and meet people more casually, but maybe you're more structurally driven, maybe you're more introverted, you really feel uncomfortable asking and approaching people. This is a great way. It's just message them and ask for some time in advance. The critical thing you need to do is that last few words, prove that you're not a weirdo. Because again, anybody who you want to talk to probably has other inbound as well. And oftentimes, let's just be honest, at a crypto conference, most people are weirdos. So you gotta distinguish yourself in some kind of fashion. So saying like, hey, my app has X number of users, or I think we know XYZ person in common, uh, or just making a light joke. Any of those kinds of things can uh, can help your situation. Number 11, make your Telegram QR code your phone background for easy group chat creation. Self-explanatory, no-brainer. Classic. So fun. I would also maybe add to this, a lot, of, a lot of people, they don't seem to get like an eSIM or have a data plan and they rely on Wi-Fi. I think it's pretty important. <laughs> to make sure you've got a, a decent SIM card in your phone to get the, the internet going. Uh, number 12 is also another self-explanatory one. Take selfies with people you meet. I've done this as well, but then I haven't added any text as context. And then I'm like, can't remember who that person was. And then number 13. You know, this is something that happens a lot or has happened to me and it just never really works is that I'll meet somebody at a conference and then like, you know, 20 minutes later, they'll send me their calendar or ask for my calendar. And I'm already talking to like 10 other people at this point. And my mind is like so completely not in the space to, to plan anything post-conference. Conferences are a little bit like kind of these, these time vacuums, right? Like they're these black holes that are just, you just kind of swirl around in it and it's all you can think about and all you can see. I typically find it much better to either approach people a few days after the conference and I generally appreciate when people approach me a few days after the conference with a little quick reminder you know maybe you send a selfie then if you haven't already yeah definitely want to add some context in and be like hey can we grab a time to talk don't message them during the conference it's just likely to get washed out in the noise really works well number 14 is dance if you have the skills or if you want to make yourself look silly it's fun it's good for you apparently here's a little cheat code and i say this as a guy who cannot dance very well the only way 
to look bad when you're dancing is to be self-conscious about it. If you are having fun, it always comes across in dancing. There is no such thing as a good or a bad dancer. There are only self-conscious dancers and not self-conscious dancers. If you see me on the dance floor, I'm not fucking break dancing or anything like that. I'm not going crazy. I'm just doing my little one, two step, keeping it very simple and it's fine. That's all you need to be doing. You don't have to go crazy and you know do the robot, uh, but you should go and dance. This has been great advice. Uh, initially, we're, we're gonna separate it to founders and or normie crypto peoples. However, I don't think that's really necessary. If you're not a founder, if you're just trying to make friends, the points have been covered, you know, speak to people sitting by themselves, don't party hop every two minutes and be the person to take the first step. Well, thanks Cash, thanks for all the alpha. I know I've got some more skills now to speak to people, not be so socially awkward. And uh, for anyone that wants to find out about what is Super Team or where to find you, where should they go? What should they do? Uh, you can go follow me on Twitter or go to superteam.fun to learn more about what Super Team is. It's a, in short, it's the talent layer for Solana. We're helping onboard builders and contributors all over the world. Uh, but if you're watching this right now, you are in luck because the Solana Global Hackathon is happening right now. In addition to the half million dollars of prizes in the main tracks, we also have more than $300,000 of sidetrack prizes. This is where the alpha is, folks, because there's gonna be a lot less competition for these. So if you are a founder, this is a great time uh, to submit your project, potentially earn some distribution, earn some credibility, and earn some funds. And if you've ever thought about building something, this is the perfect time to learn. Learn by building, don't learn just by reading. Go learn something, check out the tracks, there's specific ideas that you can build uh, to start to level up your skills today. That's earn.superteam.fun. Awesome, $300,000, it's well worth your time. Thanks for holding our hand as we navigate how to speak to people at conferences. We all need it, appreciate it.